Hi class, I hope everyone is doing well and staying inside. Um, this week we're going to be moving on to a new uh, topic. Um, so in the uh, class page under the schedule, we're under week nine now. Um, so we're going to keep working on our uh, pattern generator project. Um, last week we used the loop to create a pattern with some variation. Uh, this week we're going to add a user interface to give our user control over some aspects of the pattern. Um, so that'll be the second part. Next week we're going to make more complex patterns by uh, adding more to our loop. Um, and so we'll put those three things together and that will be uh, project three. Um, so in this video I'm going to go over some examples uh, using DOM elements. In the next video, I'll give some examples of um, incorporating these uh, DOM elements into the pattern generation project that we did last week. So this is under week nine, DOM elements. Uh, I'm gonna just kind of do an example where I'm gonna build on uh, what you see in the examples. So I'll mostly just be writing some code in here, but it should follow along um, what you see in the class note. So I'm gonna start by just opening up the GitHub desktop. I want to make sure that my repository is up to date. So I'm going to choose MMP210 and click Fetch Origin. Um, and then from here, I can open up my project in Sublime Text. Um, so here's my Sublime Text. Uh, it's a bit small. Um, so on the Mac, I can just double click on that to change the size. Um, if I want to get the whole window. Uh, and then I'm gonna click uh, Show in Finder um, to see uh, my MMP210 folder here. Um, so you can see I have uh, all the projects leading up to, to today, and there's pattern one. So I'm just gonna do an example. So I'm gonna make a new folder uh, that's just for this example. Um, so you guys don't have to create this one unless you want to follow along. I'm going to copy the index and P5 and style, but I'll make a new sketch. Um, so I'm going to make a new folder, and I'm just going to call this DOM. So this is an example for the DOM. Uh, and I'm going to copy all these files except for sketch.js, which I'll be writing a new version of. So I'll do Command C to copy, and then go to DOM, and Command V to paste. So then when I go back to Sublime, so I won't add a link for this one because I'm just doing an example. Um, here's the index.html. I'm going to increase the size a bit here. Um, so this is just our DOM example. And I'll change this to DOM example. Um, and DOM is actually uh, capitalized. I'll explain. It's actually an abbreviation, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, so that's my index page. And the style page, we're actually going to add some stuff here, which we haven't done in a while. Um, so that's the style page that I've kind of been up using throughout the semester. But today, we're actually going to add some stuff in there for the first time. Um, and then I'm going to create a new file for sketch.js. So I'll hit Command N, and then Command S to save as. Um, select the DOM folder, so MMP210 DOM, and then call this sketch.js. Click save. So I'll just put a comment to start um, DOM example. And the date is April 1st, 2020. Uh, happy April Fool's Day. Um, and so we're just going to get started with a new sketch here uh, where we're going to introduce um, some new uh, DOM elements. Um, and so when I say DOM, okay, so what I, when I say DOM, what I'm talking about is the document object model. Um, and basically what the document object model is, is this kind of idea of how an, a web page works um, that allows us to communicate between the HTML, uh, the CSS, and the JavaScript. Um, so there's a link here to the P5 reference for the DOM. Um, it should scroll directly there, but I'll just click on the DOM. And so these are functions that we can use to actually create uh, DOM elements um, or HTML elements and update our CSS on the page. Um, and so that means that we can create like user uh, interface elements that um, the user is familiar with. Um, so I'm going to 
get our sketch started and then I'll show a quick example of what this means. Um, so for our regular sketch, we have functions set up and I'm just going to do a create canvas as usual. And we're going to do 640 uh, by 360 as usual. And that's actually all I need to do to start to give an example of what I want to show. So now that we have our setup, we can uh, go to the Sublime server. So I'll go to Tools, Sublime Server, and start Sublime Server. And once the Sublime Server is started, we can go back to the browser and go to our local host, local host uh, 8080. So there's MMP210, we can click on that. And I didn't actually add this example to the home page, so I can just type in uh, the name of the folder at the end of this URL if I want to go there. And so here's our DOM example. We don't see anything right now. We've just done the setup. But if we look in the Elements tab over here, you can see what Create Canvas does. And we've actually we've looked at this before in class, but I just want to go over it again. So there's the Create Canvas, um, and essentially. Uh, create canvas is actually a DOM function um, that we've been using all semester uh, because it actually creates an element in um, our uh, HTML. So what document object model means, any website essentially has three different components or three different languages. There's HTML. Okay, that's this stuff right here, um, which determines what the page looks like, the markup. So that's the content that we see on the page like this header, this link, and then our canvas uh, as well. Um, it also has CSS. Uh, that is, um, let's take a look at sources. So the CSS determines the styling for the page. Uh, so we think, see things like the text color here, the font size, um, and the background as well. So CSS determines um, what elements on the page look like. And then the last part, so we have HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript, which is what we've been mostly doing in this class. And the JavaScript right here is what creates the functionality on the page. Um, and so what the DOM does is it connects these three different components. If we wanna do something in JavaScript here, create canvas, so the create canvas here, that actually creates this canvas element over here. Um, so what DOM lets us do is basically communicate if we're in JavaScript and we want to make HTML, we can do that. Um, if we're in HTML and we're loading CSS, we can do that. Um, all of our three components can communicate with each other. Um, so what we're going to look at today so what we're going to look at today is how to add uh, new HTML elements to our project, but through our JavaScript page. Um, so I'm just going to set up a really simple pattern similar to the one that we did last week using a for loop. So like we had last week, I'm going to make a function pattern where we draw the pattern. And I'll call that in the setup function at the beginning just so it draws. Um, and so the pattern is kind of taking place of our draw function because we don't want to be drawing our graphics over and over again right now. Um, so in my pattern function, I'm just going to do a simple uh, example like we did last week. So I'm going to draw a background um, that's black. Um, or actually, let's do a color. Let's do uh, light blue. So I'll do a for loop. Um, I'll start with the x axis. So I'll say let x equal zero. Uh, and I'll go all the way across the page. So I'll say x is less than or equal to width. And then I'll increase um, by, let's say, uh, 100 pixels um, each time. So I think that's similar to what we did last week. And for now, I'm just going to draw an ellipse, uh, nothing too complicated. So I'm going to say fill is plum and draw an ellipse. And the ellipse will go at x. Uh, and for the height, I'll just do height over 2 for the y value. Uh, and for the size, I'll do, um, let's say, random. So I'll just use a random number between 100 and 200. Uh, and actually, since we're doing a little pattern, I'll randomize the y value as well. So I'll just say random height here. So we can see a little bit of difference each time. So that's our for loop. It's not a very complicated pattern, but uh, we are going to be able to see it change, which is what we're going to add a button to do. 
Um, and I'm just going to remove the stroke just to make it a little simpler. Okay, so now we can see that we know as a developer that if we hit reload on the page, the pattern changes. Uh, but our user has no indication that that's the case. So they'd have no reason to reload the page. Um, so in previous interactive classes, we added instructions. We said, you know, uh, move the mouse to change the design or something like that. Um, but we can actually use user interface elements to have some signal for the user that they can change something, um, but also like have a button or another thing that the user can interact with. Um, so adding a button uh, in P5 is pretty simple. Um, there's a more complicated way that we could do it where we would actually add an HTML button in our HTML and then get a reference to it in our JavaScript and then go from there. But with P5, using the uh, DOM uh, functions, we can just create a button directly from our JavaScript. So I'm going to say a variable um, button equals uh, create button. And that'll make a button. Um, what I need to do is I want to put some text inside the button. So I'm going to give this some text. So I'm going to say um, uh, new pattern. So that'll generate a new pattern. So once I've created that button, it'll show up on the page. OK, there's our new pattern button right there. Um, and it's kind of like sticking next to our uh, canvas, which doesn't look that great. But we can fix that later. For now, I'll just make the window a bit smaller. Um, but so our new pattern button is actually inside the HTML. So when I said uh, create button, what happened is it created this HTML button that you can see uh, in our uh, HTML document. Um, and then of course the new pattern uh, text in the button is generated uh, by this string right here. Um, so right now the button doesn't do anything, but we get some advantage with a button. It looks like a button. The user is probably familiar with what a button looks like. And when we click on it, it changes color. So we can see, we can verify that we're actually doing something. Um, so to make the button actually generate a new pattern, we need to connect it to our pattern function. Uh, and that's actually quite easy. I can just say button dot mouse pressed. So similar to the mouse press function that we actually used last week to generate a new uh, pattern. Um, and then I'll just put the pattern function right in there. Um, so this is going to call this whenever the mouse is pressed, but only on the button. So that's what the button.mousepress does, is it connects this mouse press to the button element. So now if I click the page, nothing happens. But if I click the new pattern button, I get a new pattern each time. Um, so that's pretty exciting. So let's add another button. And for this button, what we can do is save the image. Uh, so the user can actually create a pattern that they like and then save uh, the image to use, you know, on their own uh, website or if they can, you know, they could post it on social media or something like that. Um, so since we're going to have two buttons in this part, let's give this button a more specific name. So let's say this is the pattern button. And so then we have to change this uh, reference to it as well. So we can just put pattern button right there. Um, and so that'll still work. We can still generate a new pattern. But what we can do now is add another button. Um, and this is going to be to save the image. So we're going to say variable save button. And we'll do another create button and just say save image. So the user knows what this button is going to do. And then for this one, we can actually, there's a P5 function that we can connect this to that already exists. Uh, but we're going to extend it a little bit. So let's try that first. So I'm going to connect this to the save function. And the save function is kind of like set up um, in that P5 already created it for us. So we don't have to define it. Um, so when I reload this page, I can change the pattern a bit till I find something I like and then click save image. And so that's actually going to save to my downloads folder, which is a convenient function to use. But we can see if I go to my downloads folder, uh, so I'll go to the finder and go to downloads, you can see the image name is untitled.png. Um, that's OK. That's not such a big deal. The image still looks like an image, and we could still use it. But if we want to name the image, then we have to give the save function an argument. Um, so we have to make our, uh, our code a little bit more uh, we have to extend the code a little bit. So when we put save in here, we can't add parentheses like that. It won't really work that way. 
Um, so what we need to do is create a different function that calls the save function. Um, so I'm going to make a new function called save image. And so we're kind of creating our own functions now. We haven't talked a lot about how to do that. We will actually in a couple of weeks go over a lot more detail on how to make a function. But for now, all we have to know is to make a new function, just write the word function, uh, give it a name like a variable, um, and give it some parentheses at the end, and then, a, and then curly brackets for the code block. So just like all the functions we've used for P5 setup, um, we also obviously created this pattern function when we renamed the draw function. So once we get into the save image function, so we, when we click the save button uh, with the mouse pressed, that will call the save image function. So in here, we can call save again, but this time we're gonna give it a string argument for what we want it to be called. And we can also specify what type of image we want. So I'm gonna call this pattern.png. And you'll see now when I reload the page and save an image, now the name of that image is pattern.png. So we can see that right there. Um, so we can actually change the name that the image saves. And if we want to make it a different type of image, we can also say pattern.jpg. Um, and if I reload and save a new pattern, we can see that there's pattern.jpg. And that's actually uh, a JPEG image, which we can see right there. Um, and you can see all the images types have different compression algorithms. Some are good and you know some are better. Uh, the pattern is 16 kilobytes, the uh, pattern.png is 16 kilobytes, pattern.jpg is 8 kilobytes, so it's a little bit smaller. In fact, it's half as big. Um, so you might want to use different image types uh, depending on what you're doing. I think the, the PNG is probably a little better quality, although it's very difficult to tell um, when you're just using a couple colors and some basic shapes. But you can kind of see that the, the PNG, the circles are a little bit sharper versus the JPEG, they're a little blurry around the edges. At least it seems like that. I don't, I don't know if that's just my eyes playing tricks on me. I'm gonna open these up and zoom in. So that's the PNG when we zoom in a lot versus the JPEG. Yeah, so you can actually pretty well see the difference here um, between those two file types uh, where you can see a lot of artifacts of the compression in here versus this is a very smooth line. Um, and so that's why, you know, the JPEG is smaller, um, so it takes up less space, but it's actually not quite as good uh, resolution. Anyway, uh, just, you know, it's a little bit of a sidebar, um, so let's continue. Uh, so uh, we can also add buttons to change the pattern. So right now our user can generate a new pattern, uh, they can save the image, um, but let's give them the ability to actually change what's happening in the pattern. Um, and for this example, I'm going to combine a couple other things that we looked at uh, in a, a, a two weeks ago when we were doing transformation. Um, so you don't have to do it this way, but I just want to give some examples of how we can combine the different concepts that we're uh, covering this semester. Um, so I'm going to go back to the code, and I'm going to change up my, um, my for loop a little bit, because what I want to do is give the user the ability to rotate um, the pattern. Uh, and so to do that, I need to use translate and rotate. Um, and to do that with a pattern, since we're moving across the canvas, we don't want to like rotate each time we draw a new part of our, our pattern. We're also going to have to use push and pop. So I have my, uh, my basic pattern. So I'm going to change this from an ellipse to a rectangle. Um, I'm going to add a random height over here as well. Uh, and so let's take a look at that. Okay, so we get these different squares, some interesting patterns. I guess I don't need to use the uh, refresh there. Um, so let's now add some rotation to that. If So if we want to rotate each one, we're going to have to do push and pop. So if I said rotate, and let's say I just rotated by a small number like 0 0.1 times pi. You can see it's gonna, most of our squares actually go off the screen because we're rotating a little bit more each time. Uh, and so most of our squares disappear completely. Um, so then what we should do is uh, do push and pop. So if I do push here and pop down here, now it'll just rotate each rectangle separately. 
Okay, so we can see the different rectangles and they all have the same rotation because they're all being rotated separately. So that looks good and that's kind of interesting. You might say, this is what I want, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, but one thing that you'll notice is that they're all rotating from the same uh, origin point, uh, which is up here. So if the rectangle is right here, it would be rotating around that origin point. So that's why the rectangles over here are rotated farther down than the ones over here. Um, so if we wanna change that, we need to change the orientation where the rectangles are rotating. Um, so to do that, I can use uh, translate. So before I, after I push, I'll do translate, and I'll just translate to X. Uh, and then for Y, I'll just put in, um, uh, let's just say random height. We'll move the Y there. So then instead of X and random height for my rectangle, now I'm translating there. So that origin point now becomes zero, zero. Um, so now each rectangle is rotating around its own origin point. And I think actually this will look a little bit more clear if I put uh, y at height over two and not random for a moment. Okay, so you can kind of see how they're all rotating the same amount. Um, if we change that rotation, then they'll all be rotating more. So we're kind of creating some different patterns. We're gonna add some more variation to this in a second. We could create the new pattern, but we can also give the user the ability to change what this rotation value is. Um, and so we can do that using another button. Um, and so in order to do that, we need this number for the rotation to be a variable. Um, that's the only way that we'll be able to accept, access that number and change it uh, using our button. Um, so I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit so we can see more of our program. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna add a new variable called angle and start it at zero. And I'll set the rotate to angle times pi. Um, so we'll just change that angle variable with a button and then the user will be able to update the pattern angle. Um, so let's make our third button. And the order of this actually matters. So if we wanna have like new pattern, save image, if we wanna actually put this uh, rotate button uh, before, um, we'd have to put it earlier in our code. Um, so the order that we create the buttons is actually the order that they'll show up on the screen. So I'll do a rotate button. So we'll do create button, rotate. Uh, and then we can say rotate button dot mouse pressed and we'll just have to call a new function here so we'll say update angle and we're just going to change the angle variable um, that we have in the global scope now so that way that angle variable is going to be available to our update angle as well as our pattern function so after save image let's add function update angle and i'm just going to increase the angle a bit i'm going to say angle plus equals 0.1 so the user will actually be able to see the pattern rotating as they change it. And after we update the angle, let's just call pattern again so they don't have to hit the button again to change, to see the update. Um, so again, when we click the rotate button, we're gonna call this update angle function down here. That's gonna increase the angle by a very small number. So we're gonna take the angle and then we're gonna plus equals, so add to it 0.1. So remember, pi is, is very small, so we're dealing with very small numbers when we're talking about angles. Um, so we just wanna do 0 0.1 so it won't go too far, and then we're gonna draw the pattern again. So let's go back to our code and see that working. Okay, so we can rotate, and you can say it's actually, you can see it's rotating by a fairly large amount each time. So we can change that by making this number even smaller. So now it'll rotate very slowly. Okay, or we could make it a little bit bigger if we wanted to go somewhere in the middle. 
that's pretty good. And then we can start generating new patterns based on that rotation. And I kind of want my rectangles to go all the way to the other side of the page. So if I wanted to do that, I could actually increase, instead of just width, maybe I'll say width plus 100. So they'll actually go off the screen that way. And so I can create some new patterns like that. And then when I get something I like, I'll just click Save Image. So essentially, we're just creating interface elements that the user is familiar with in order to let them update or change their pattern. In the next example, what we can do is we can actually add a different type of HTML input, uh, which is the slider. Um, and that we can actually give, instead of just clicking a button to change the rotation, with the slider, the user will actually be able to rotate um, to a specific angle uh, by moving the slider back and forth. Um, so let's take a look at that. Um, so I'm going to leave most of this the same because uh, we're still going to be using this angle, but we're going to be setting the angle with a slider instead of a button. So for the fl slider example, I don't need the angle because um, I'm just going to use the slider as a reference for that. So, but I still need a, a global reference to the slider. So I'm going to change this from uh, angle to, let's call it angle slider. And now instead of adding a button here, I'm just going to say angle slider. And then this time you'll see that I don't have var in front of it because this angle slider is going to be uh, referenced in both setup and pattern. Um, so for angle slider, uh, I'm going to, I'll take the angle slider and I'll use the function create slider. Uh, and so with the slider function, we have to give it a little bit more information. So we have to give it three values. Um, and we can see this in the P5 reference. If I go to p5js.org and go to reference, and then we're looking at DOM. And if I go to create slider, uh, you can see some examples of the sliders changing the color. Uh, and then we can see that to create a slider, we need a minimum value, a max value an optional starting value, and then an optional um, step or how much it changes um, each time. So for ours, let's start. So our minimum value is zero, and our maximum value is one's rotation, so we can do two pi. Um, and so let's leave that for now, and then we'll come back in a second. So then we have to actually connect the angle slider um, to the pattern. So we want to regenerate the pattern um, each time we move the slider. So we can just say angle slider dot input and the input is anytime the user moves um, the slider thumb. So anytime we move it, it'll redraw the pattern. And so now we actually don't need this update angle function anymore because uh, the pattern is being called by our slider event. Uh, but we do need to get this angle. So now that angle slot is going to be the angle slider. And then we get the value of the, c the current value of the slider by saying angle slider dot value. Um, so let me make a little more space for that. So angle slider dot value, and then we're going to multiply that by pi. Um, so you notice a couple things when we do this, and then we'll fix it a bit. So let's go back. And so we're starting at zero, and we're going to two pi. Um, so now, uh, Oh, I'm actually getting an error here, and I'll just talk about why, because um, I'm going to have to change the code a bit. So right now, I'm actually calling the pattern function before uh, I'm initializing the angle slider, which is why I get an error on line 35. Um, so I can't reference the angle slider unless I've actually declared it first. So I just need to move this pattern function uh, down here to make sure that the angle slider already exists before I try to use it. So let's try that again. So we have the angle slider. You can see it's starting in just this kind of arbitrary place. Uh, and then when we move it, it's just kind of like flipping up and down. Um, because basically 0 and 2 pi, uh, they're not very far apart from each other. So I have the angle slider dot value. That's going for between 0 and pi. So I'm just going to take out the multiplied by pi. Um, since we're not dealing with just the number anymore, uh, we have a range from 0 to pi. We don't need to multiply by pi anymore. Okay, so now we can see it's starting in kind of an arbitrary place, but as we move it, 
uh, it updates. But it updates in these kind of like big chunks because the default for a slider is to move in increments of one. That's why like it doesn't actually make it to the end of the slider window because that the last value for 2 pi is like 6.28 something something. So let's update this. So we'll give it a starting value. Okay, so we'll just start it at zero. And then we can change the step here. So this is where we can use pi again. So we don't want to go by pi. Um, that's like, you know, that would be too far. Uh, so if we did pi as the step, then it would go, you know, it basically just flips up and down, which is not exactly what we want. We want some variation in between uh, zero pi and two pi. So let's multiply pi by a really small number. So if we do 0.1, now our step will be, uh, there'll be 10 steps in between 0 and pi, and then 10 more steps to 2 pi. Okay, so that's kind of nice. Um, we get this kind of, kind of like slow rotating animation. Um, if we make that number even smaller, then we'll get a really smooth increment between all the different rotations. So depending on the effect you're going for, you can change that step value um, to get, you know, smoother rotation or more kind of chunky rotation. And so again, once we choose a rotation, we can generate some new patterns, uh, and we can also save the image when we're ready. Um, so that's the slider. That's another type of element that you could add for your user. Um, there's one more input that I'm going to cover, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to actually change the style of these buttons. Um, so this is a little bit different um, since it's not going to directly affect our sketch that we have so far. Um, you could actually have the user input certain things, but uh, for this one, we're just going to use a user input where they can actually type uh, words into the uh, interface, and then we can display those words in our sketch. So um, for this one, again, we're going to need a global variable because we're going to need to set it up uh, in the setup function, but then display it in the pattern function. So uh, I'm going to say variable uh, name input. And this is a little bit different in the uh, notes in the class example, but I'm just going to kind of add it on top of what we've already got here. Um, so in setup, I'm going to set up my name input. I'm just going to say uh, name input gets uh, create input. And I'm just going to put some text in there to kind of prompt the user. So I'm going to say uh, type your name. And so what we'll display is that string, and then the user will be able to update it. Um, and that's really all we have to do because the name input is a, is a default input. So if I reload the page, you'll see there's an input here. Uh, I'm going to zoom in a bit because uh, it's quite small. OK, so there's the name input right there. And so I can type in here. I can. Uh, get rid of this text and type hello or whatever I want in there. Um, but what we want to do is actually show that in the sketch so our user can like interact with the sketch. So just like we have angle.value, we can take uh, name input.value. Um, so let's just draw this on top of our pattern. I'll make some text. So I'll say like text align, let's do center, comma, center. I'll do text size, let's make it big so it's visible. Uh, and then let's do a fill, maybe make it uh, blue. And a stroke, maybe make it pink or plum to match. And let's do a stroke weight so it's a little bit bigger, uh, maybe like 10. And then I'm just going to put my text. So I have a text. Uh, function to draw some text. And we're just going to take this name input and then add the value there. So I'll say name input dot value. So the value, the name input is a reference to the actual input box itself. The value is whatever the, uh, the user writes in there. So then I need to give the text a position. So I'll just say width over two, height over two to put it in the middle of the canvas. Um, and then you'll see that it, it starts with type your name at the beginning. Um, so we can uh, delete that and say, uh, you know, banana or whatever we want. And then it will update um, to show the name that we put. So now we can make a pattern related to um, a piece of text. 
Um, so yeah, this is a little bit of a divergence from what I did in the in the in the notes on the examples, but I'm just kind of adding everything together. Um, so let's actually make that stroke weight even bigger. I think that might look kind of cool. I'll put uh, banana as the name. All right. So it doesn't really look like a banana, but it's kind of interesting. And so then if we get something that we like, something around here, uh, we can save that image. And now I have like a little um, logo. Where is it? There we go. Uh, so yeah, so the user can actually kind of change the design um, that they see on the screen. Um, so I think that's all of the examples of different elements. So um, right now these UI elements, they obviously don't look super great. So let's look at a couple ways that we can actually um, style them with the CSS. Uh, so you can actually change the CSS styles in uh, JavaScript, but since we already have a style page, um, a simpler way to do it is actually just to create a generic style um, on the CSS style page. And then because these are our HTML, elements, they will take on those styles. So let's go back um, to our code. And so now I'm going to open up my style.css for the first time in a while. So we have some basic stuff here. We have some like the body styles, h1, etc. These are all mostly for the content on the page, like the, the home page and the links and stuff like that. So let's go down here and we'll just add some interface styles. So we can start with just the kind of generic button. So if I just put button here in CSS, it'll affect every single button in the website. Um, and so I can just, you know, make some basic changes to how the buttons look to make them kind of fit more with my theme. So maybe with the background for my buttons, I would do um, maybe plum to match uh, the rest of the design. Okay, so that, so we can see the buttons now have a plum background. Um, so there's a lot of default styles that come with buttons that we kind of have to overwrite. Um, so I'm going to click on this and inspect it. And we can see all of the default styles for the button. If I click on that button and then I go down here in Chrome to the, the styles, you can see I've added this background style uh, to make the buttons plumb. But look at all these defaults. So all of this stuff we have to rewrite if we want to change the appearance. So um, the color... Uh, the uh, the display, um, the uh, font here, padding, all this stuff does not match the rest of our design. Um, so I'm going to make some updates here. So uh, for the background, I did plum. Let's set the border because the, the button has this very specific border. So let's make the border, um, let's make it light blue to match uh, our design. Uh, and then actually for CSS for the border, I need to give it some more input. So let's say it's one pixel solid light blue. Okay, maybe make it a little bit bigger, two pixels. I'm going to zoom out a bit so we can see what this really looks like. Okay, and let's maybe give it a border radius so we can get some nice rounded edges. So I'll say the border radius is maybe like three pixels. Okay, that's starting to look a little bit better. Uh, let's see. And then we can also make the font size a bit bigger. So maybe make it like 20 pixels. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Um, and so you can see that those styles are applying just to the button, um, not to the this input. Uh, so if we want to apply styles to that input as well, um, we can do so with the input. So I could see if I just do comma input, it'll add those styles to the input. So that looks pretty close already. That's not so bad. Um, the slider is a bit harder to style. Uh, it's an input type range, and it has a lot of default styles to make it look the way it looks. Um, so I'll just, I'm probably just going to leave that for now. Uh, if you guys want to style that later, maybe we can do like a mini lesson on that. Um, but for now, that's actually much more complicated, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Um, 
A couple of things I can also do with the CSS to kind of make this look a bit better. Uh, maybe I'll make the canvas, uh, you know, block display so that this slider isn't sitting right there. Um, or I could actually make all of these guys display block. So then they'll just line up at the bottom here. Um, and then maybe I'll give them a little bit of a margin so that they're not sitting on top of each other. So I'll say margin, uh, let's just do uh, three pixels, top and bottom, zero, right and left. Uh, maybe we'll increase that a bit. And then if I want to change the, um, the order of these elements, maybe I'll put the name input at the top. So I'll move this up to the top. Okay, so now I can type in my name, banana. And I can make some updates here and change the pattern. And then save the image. So kind of combining a bunch of different stuff here, um, but we can look at easy ways to update the CSS to fit in uh, more with our um, design. Um, another thing I could do with the button, maybe I'll change the color to plum to match the border. Oh, no, light blue, not plum. Mm, that doesn't, that's a little hard to read. So maybe we'll use the blue instead of the light blue here. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Um, so yeah, so now we have a little bit of a user interface. Um, so one last bit, and this is gonna add a few new concepts as well. So one last bit here is if we wanna actually take these elements and put them like in our canvas, that's a little bit trickier uh, with the CSS. So there's a few things we can do to set that up. Um, this part isn't really necessary. So unless you really want your interface integrated with your canvas, you can just skip this part. But I'm sure at least a couple of you guys have said, you know, let's, how do I get the buttons on the canvas? So let's look at how to do that. So we, we have our canvas here, we have our input and uh, our slider and our two buttons. Um, but what if we wanted to move these guys actually into the canvas so it all looked like one thing? Um, there is a way that we can do that, but it's a bit tricky. So we can use JavaScript to position our buttons. Um, so if I go to sketch, and for example, I'll start with the name input. If I said uh, name input dot position, we can use position like X and Y, but what it's actually doing is setting um, CSS values. So let's say I said the position is 10, 10. You would expect that to be, you know, somewhere in the top left corner here. Um, but what we'll see is it's actually in the top left corner all the way at the top of the canvas. Okay, so the reason that happens, if we click on this input, um, or sorry, this text input, you can see it changes the position to absolute and the left is 10 pixels and the top is 10 pixels. And so if we wanna fix that, there's a way to do it, um, but we have to add a little bit to our, our CSS and our JavaScript. So basically uh, what's happening here is that the position absolute is relative to whatever the container in the HTML page is. So um, we have this like div ID container, which just has the header and the menu, um, but our canvas isn't actually inside of that container at all. Um, the canvas is kind of in its own uh, space. And our other HTML elements are also just kind of like added to the body of the page. So this input is positioned relative to the body, uh, which, you know, doesn't have the canvas in it. So if we want to position it relative to the canvas, we need to add a new div where we can add all these elements into one area and then use CSS positioning to make it look like they're on top of each other. So the first thing we need to do is add a new uh, div to our HTML that can contain everything else in our um, project. So I'll go to index.html and just before, uh, we're gonna actually put this after the container. Um, you could put it inside of the container if you want. Um, Either way, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, so we'll just put div ID is sketch. Okay, so we'll just use that ID as a way to know 
um, where we want to add in our new HTML elements. Um, so then for the sketch, we're going to add some CSS styles. So we're going to be actually quite similar to the container. Um, so uh, I'm just going to add a, a new style here. I'm going to say ID sketch. Uh, and I'm going to add some similar stuff. I'm going to say max width. Um, I think my sketch is actually bigger than 600 pixels. So I'll use the 640 there. Um, so I'll do 640 pixels. Uh, so that way it won't get, you know, everything will be contained inside of the 640 pixels. And I'll use the same margin as zero auto just to make everything the same width. Um, and maybe I'll change this guy to 640 as well so they match. And then I'm just going to say position is relative. And I need to add that in there. What that's basically going to do is say that I can position other elements inside of this uh, div relative to um, the div itself. Uh, so now I have this container for the sketch. Um, it's not going to automatically have stuff in it. We need to do that in the JavaScript. So here's our sketch. Um, so we have container, then we have the sketch, but there's nothing in there right now. We need to get JavaScript to put the canvas in there as well as the rest of these guys. Um, so if we go to sketch.js, uh, we can assign the create canvas um, to the uh, to a variable, and then we can use the parent um, function to add it into our sketch. So we can say variable canvas equals create canvas, and then I can say uh, canvas dot parent is sketch. So it'll use uh, the sketch ID to look up that element, and then what I'm saying with dot parent is we're actually going to make this canvas. We're going to make the parent of the canvas uh, the sketch. And so you'll see what that does. The first thing it does is it centers the sketch because we added that CSS. Um, so we have the container and the sketch that have kind of similar rules. Um, so the sketch will be centered. Uh, and right now, our inputs are still outside in the body, but now our canvas is inside of this uh, div ID equals sketch. So if we want to put our other elements inside there, um, we can go and we can say uh, name input dot parent is sketch and you'll see that name input now moves inside of the sketch window or the sketch element um, and so that actually makes it look like the input is on top of the canvas because the input is position absolute uh, left is 10 top is 10 so if I take that out it goes below but as long as you have position absolute it's gonna force these guys to be in the same place um, and then if I take out the left and the top, that changes the positioning as well. Um, and so that's possible because this sketch is position relative. If I turn that off, now it goes back to the body. So it's a bit complicated, but if you want your elements to look like they're part of the canvas, this is the easiest way to do it. So we can take the rest of our elements. Um, so we'll take our angle slider and say the parent is sketch, uh, take our pattern button and say parent is sketch and then we'll take the save button and also parent that to the sketch and so now you can see here's our sketch div canvas name input then our slider and our two buttons. These guys are still below the canvas, but now they're at least inside the sketch. So then we can use the position um, to move them around. So if we want to put our angle slider in the sketch, we can say angle slider dot position. And we can say maybe like 200 on X and 10 on Y to place it up there. Okay, maybe move it a bit farther. Okay, or if we want to place it below the name input, we could keep X the same, 10, and move it down a bit to like 40. Okay, so now it's down here. And then if we want to move these buttons, we can do that as well. So maybe I'll put the pattern button next to the name input. So I'll say pattern button dot position. Um, so I'll move over on the X, I'll say like 240, I think, and then keep the same Y. Okay, maybe a little less, 220. Okay, and then the save button, 
I can do the same thing, save button dot position. And we'll move that even farther. So that'll be like 280 maybe, and same Y. Oh, even farther, let's try 320. Okay, let's try 350. Okay, there we go. So now we have our name here, so I can type uh, banana and do a new pattern, and I can change the values. And then I can still save the image. You'll notice that the buttons are not part of the save image because these elements are not part of the canvas. So I can still click save image, and we'll see that uh, pattern six doesn't have any buttons in it. Again, those buttons are not part of the canvas. They're their own HTML elements. Okay, so that about covers it uh, for some of the basics of adding DOM elements into your P5 project. Um, in the next video, uh, I'll do some examples using the actual pattern so you can start working on the homework for the pattern generation. Uh, but until I post that, see how far you can get on your own. Take some of these concepts and look at your uh, pattern project that you created last week and see if you can integrate these concepts um, to changing parts of the pattern before I actually go over the demo. So I'll post that video soon, um, but take some time and see if you can actually get it going uh, just on your own.